Um, we're very happy to have Jenna back. She was last here, I think, in 2011 after the Storm oh Chasers gosh. came out. I know, I can't believe it was that long ago. Yeah, and the weird thing is, it's raining again. It poured the last time you Sorry. came. I don't know what it is for the weather. But, um, yeah. We're so happy to have her back to talk about The Lost Family, which was named a People Magazine Best Book of the Week in June when it first came out. Jenna is author of several books, including the New York Times bestselling Those Who Saved Us. My favorite, I think. Um, she's been named one of Oprah's top 30 women writers and has taught fiction and master novel workshops at Grub Street Writers since the school's founding in 1997. She has also taught creative writing and journal journalism at her alma mater, BU. And I'd love to hear more about this. For four years, she interviewed Holocaust survivors for the Steven Spielberg Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. So Jenna's going to talk, she's going to read from her book, she'll answer your questions, she will sell and sign copies of her book, and we have refreshments in the back. Please help me welcome Jenna Blum. <laughs> Just like when I was teaching at BU and everybody would filter toward the back of the room, except usually there was one person in the front row who was like, I know everything, I've been here since 5.30 a.m. <laughs> but yeah, so if you can't hear me, feel free to move up. I am super glad to be here tonight. This is my first like civilized appearance um, after a month vacation that I just took at my family home in Minnesota where I was in my country girl persona, which is just like no makeup, t-shirt, I have a garden, I can everything from the garden, and that's it. Like that's all I do for like a month. And then I get in my car and I drive 1,500 miles on I-90 with my very elderly black lab, and all of a sudden I'm back in Boston and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so they put on makeup and get dressed, and I'm like, oh my god, there are people here! Because when I look out of my window in my house in Minnesota, I see cardinals and like my lawn, and that's about it. And then like one neighbor who's walking around like, oh yeah, a lot of rain, and we have a sinkhole. So, you know, this is a great way to um, be back in my writer and speaking milieu. I have a crazy schedule this fall and winter. I have something like 46 events between now and February, and you guys are my kickoff. So Ooh. I'm very excited about that. So thank you for coming out, especially on a rainy evening when you could be home, you know, nursing a whiskey or watching TV or like making a hot dish. Um, I am always amazed. I write because I love my characters, like I fall in love with my people. And then to download their stories from the ether in which they live onto the page, the characters forced me to stay pretty much in lockdown for like one to three years. Um, and that's a really isolated period. It's usually at my house in Minnesota where there's not much else to do, especially in the winter. Um, I wear yoga pants the whole time, although I do wash them occasionally. Um, and really the only people I see are my aforementioned black lab and my long-suffering fiance and uh, the characters. And I really love this phase of the writer life because it's magical. It's also frustrating, like on a daily basis and I whine and gripe and procrastinate a lot. Uh, but I love when you can pay the right homage to the people in your head and get them down on the page the way they're supposed to be, not the way you want them to be, but the way they really are. Um, so I love doing this. After that three years, I come out of that seclusion and there are real people there who by the miraculous osmosis known as reading, know the same people that I've been living with in my head for three years. So for you guys to take the time to read books, to get to know the characters, and then to come out on a rainy <clears throat> evening to hear a writer talk about this process is really miraculous. And I'm so grateful to libraries that provide these centers of community for us all together and talk about these things. So thank you for having me back. Apparently I didn't do anything too bad last time I was here, but, you know, except for the rain. So again, apologies. Um, how many of you have read The Lost Family? So like four of you have done your homework, the rest of you have not done your homework. Um, it's okay, you get a pass because The Lost Family is a really new book. It came out only on June 5th, 
So it's still enough of an infant that I wish I had like a baby Bjorn to carry it around in, like a book Bjorn. Um, I actually went online and looked to see if there was such a thing so that I could like, you know, walk it around and carry it from room to room. Um, all the writers are, carry our new babies around that way. Um, so it's, it's really brand new in the world. And what I thought I would do is introduce it to you by talking about how I came to write it. Um, and why, because that forestalls the inevitable question, how did you come to write this book? And then I'll read a tiny section, like really like five minute section, so you get a sense of the book's flavor, and then I will just throw open the floor to anything that you want to ask. So, The Lost Family is about, here's my elevator pitch, um, a German Jewish concentration camp survivor named Peter Rashkin, who survives a couple of different concentration camps, emigrates to the United States, to New York, and falls in love and starts a new family, even though he is still haunted by the family he lost during the war. And it turns out that his new American family, his wife and his daughter, are also haunted by the legacy of those lost people. The reason I wrote the novel <clears throat> is that, and I would welcome any questions about this from anybody, um, I interviewed Holocaust survivors for four years for the Spielberg Foundation, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and I probably interviewed maybe 60 odd survivors, because I was one of the youngest interviewers the foundation had, so they put me to work. I had a lot of stamina in those days. And um, all of the stories I heard are indelibly etched on me. I remember every one of them to the last detail. And I didn't use any of them in my novels because they don't belong to me. They are hallowed ground and belong to the survivors. But there was one story whose sort of sidebar stuck with me. And I'll tell you what it was. It was a gentleman who had been a chef in his native country, like my protagonist in the book, Peter, survived Theresienstadt and Auschwitz, came to the States, got a job as a busboy, and then was fired from his job because his tattoo from the camp upset the prosperous American diners. And the survivor telling me the story told it to me in a sort of desultory way, and I'm sure that it paled in comparison with everything he had endured before. But the, the irony of the story stuck with me, like a little fish hook in my brain, because I thought, what a cruel little irony to have endured the unimaginable, made it to what you thought was a safe place, and then still find yourself isolated by not being able to explain to anybody what had happened to you and what it was like, even if they wanted to know, and often they didn't. So I started thinking about that next chapter of the survivor's life, which we don't know as much about as we know about the atrocities of the war years. Like even in interviews, we spent a lot of time talking about survivors' lives before the war because so often those things were gone. Their villages were gone, their families were gone, whole geographies were wiped out by the Nazis, so we were trying to preserve those memories for history. We talked a lot about what happened to them during the war, in the camps, as refugees fleeing their own countries because it was an answer to revisionists who claimed the Holocaust never happened. So we were trying to pinpoint historical accuracy, again, to preserve history. And then we would spend maybe like an hour at the end of the testimonies, give or take, talking about survivors coming to this country, starting over, growing new families, you know, finding new careers, um, and the, the challenges that they faced. But it was really glossed over in comparison. And I started to wonder what it was like to be usually a young person coming to a brand new place, not knowing the language, having lost everything that you had worked for and everybody you loved and having to start all over again. And what would that be like, the sort of dislocation of that? So I started working with Peter for um, a short story collection called Grand Central which was a collection of World War II, it's nodding, thank you, Rebecca, thank you. Um, it's a collection of stories by World War II female authors, all of us who write about World War II. All of the stories are set in Grand Central Station on the same day in 1945, when people are coming home from the war. 
And P.S. Grand Central's subtitle is Original Stories of Love and Reunion. And then there was my story, which is about this young man, Peter Rashkin, getting fired from his job as a busboy at Grand Central Station and trying to throw himself off the tracks. <laughs> so people were like, how did this story get in here? Um, and much to Peter's dismay, he can't join his wife and daughters, whom he lost, um, and jump in front of an oncoming train because he believes he's too cowardly. And that was the end of my story. So I'm like, great, a story. This is about survivor guilt, and it's about dislocation, and I'm done. And everywhere I went talking about Grand Central, readers would say to me, what happened to this man? Like, you cannot just leave him on the side of the train tracks. You just have to know what happened to him. And I was really gratified because usually when readers want to know about a character, it means the character has some juice, right? It's like the Velveteen Rabbit principle. You love a character, he comes alive. Um, and I love this character too. So I was working on expanding his story. One day I was at a reading in Florida and somebody said, what are you working on next? And I explained the Peter phenomenon. And <clears throat> afterwards, in the signing line, a woman came up to me, and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, I'm so glad that you're telling that survivor's story. But I also ask you to think about his family in America. She said, my husband is the son of a Holocaust survivor. And we revere my father-in-law, we love him, but he is totally emotionally locked down. And my son has suffered his whole life because of that, because he cannot reach his father or access any of those memories or anything that happened to him. So I implore you, please write about the families. And I felt as though the universe had given me a little god wink to expand Peter's story to his American wife, June, and their daughter, Elspeth, who had been coming to me and walking around in my head anyway. And I was like, get out of here. I'm trying to work with Peter. And they were so persistent. They were like Elizabeth Warren. They kept showing up and you know, appearing in these scenes in my head while I slept and when I was in the shower. And I'm like, all right, ladies, fine. Um, so I started working on their stories as well. And the book became, to me, not just about how one person survives trauma, which if you know my other books, it's a subject that I like to return to. It became a multi-dimensional story about how does a family survive trauma? So the book asks the question not only how do you move on from something like the Holocaust? Is it really possible to start your life afresh? Can you start over again? And what is that like? Um, and then for the people who love the survivor, but can't access him because he shuts down and because he acts out in different ways and has strange predilections and strange um, cursors of PTSD. How do you, as a wife who loves this person, reach him? And if you can't reach him, what do you do? As a daughter who loves her father and knows that that man went through something horrific, how do you cope with that? So that's what The Lost Family is about. That's the short version. And you may know I'm not really capable of giving a short answer to <laughs> anything, so you are forewarned. Um, I'm going to read you a short passage, and this is really a short, a short passage from Peter's section of the book, which is in 1965. He gets a third of the novel, 1965 Manhattan, um, where he is a chef slash restaurateur at a very fufu and very beloved restaurant named Masha's where all the Upper East Side people eat and also Walter Cronkite. Mm -hmm. um, and um, June, his wife, gets the next section of the book in 1975 when she has married Peter, not a spoiler because it's on the jacket copy. And then Elspeth, their daughter, gets her own voice in 1985 so that she can give a perspective on her parents' marriage and what that's like. Um, so I'm going to read to you from the swing in 60s part of the book when um, Peter and June are in mid-courtship. Like Peter has, as I said earlier, not really wanted to be involved with anybody again. Um, but June has walked into his restaurant, Masha's, one night. She is um, a refugee from the Midwest. Her name is June Bouquet. Like Really, that's her name because in her hometown in the Midwest, it's pronounced bucket. So. She doesn't know that her name is strange until people in New York are like, June Bouquet, really? Um, and Peter gets involved with her despite his vow 
um, never to inflict himself on any woman ever again. And this scene is Christmas Eve morning, 1965, when they had just um, entered the Rainbow Room the night before, dancing. And Peter said, I love you to June, sort of by mistake. But like once it was out there, he decided not to retract it. And he's about to put her on a plane to go visit her mom in Minnesota for Christmas. Um, and first, he's going to take a shower. So this is where we start, where they've just had breakfast, and he's about to do his morning ablutions. Peter Lato, you know what? I need these glasses. Sorry about that. I forgot the glasses. Um, they're sort of new, and I got them because my fiance thought they were really cute and was like chasing me around the house when I was wearing them. And then I realized I need them to actually see. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to hold my book or my iPhone like all the way out here. So that's very exciting. Peter walked down the hall to his bathroom and shaved while he waited for the water to run hot. He would miss June, he thought. Five days in Minnesota suddenly seemed too long. Maybe he would surprise her by meeting her return plane. Hey, got room in there for me? Peter jumped and reached for his robe, but it was not in its usual place on the back of the door. I'm just about to get out, he said, if you would hand me a towel. But he was too late. The curtain rattled back on its metal rings, and then June was in there with him, naked. At least, Peter assumed she was from the warm length of her body pressed behind him. The water poured over them. It should have been erotic. You don't have to hide your scars, you know, said June. I've seen them. Peter stood dumbly. When, he asked finally. Just glimpses here and there, said June, but I felt them all along. Peter sighed, and he had been so careful. He never came to bed without pajamas. He never swam without a shirt. And he never left the bathroom door unlocked when he bathed. Happiness today had made him careless. But he should have suspected June would have felt the scars. They were thick, raised, the size of ropes. They would be tactile, even through a layer of cloth. I'm sorry, he said. They are grotesque. Oh, Peter, please, don't apologize. They're just... How did you get them? From an SS sergeant, Peter said, at Auschwitz with a whip and a bad temper. Jesus, said June. No, said Peter, just a fat man named Stolz. <laughs> he got out of the shower and pulled on his robe, started combing his hair automatically with no real idea of what he was doing. So now June had seen them, the braille of Peter's humiliation and helplessness. Next, she would want to know what it had been like. Americans always wanted to know. They were like children that way, well-meaning and insatiably curious. What was it like? What was it like, Peter's cousin Ruth had demanded the first months Peter lived with her in Larchmont, following him around with life and time, their lurid covers proclaiming, new Nazi horror discovered, thousands of corpses unearthed in pit. Did you see anything like this or this? What about this? My poor, poor booby. How did you get through it? What was it like? There had been no way to tell Ruth, even if Peter had wanted to, about the perversity of luck, for instance, so that the whipping Stoltz had given Peter on the Auschwitz Appellplatz for no reason one icy January day had laid Peter's back open to the bone, which was why Peter had passed out and been taken to the infirmary, which was where he had in his delirium called out recipes for Zauerbraten and schnitzel which was why, when he came out of it, he had been reassigned and was no longer on pickup detail, on which Peter had loaded bodies no heavier than kites onto the crematorium wagon, but on kitchen duty, which was where he was working two months later when the Allies liberated the camp. So really, the whipping Stoltz had given Peter was what had saved him, and there was no way to tell anyone who hadn't been there any of that how your very concept of luck turned inside out and upside down so that when you found yourself alive at the end of it, you were no longer sure whether that was a good thing. Peter watched June in the mirror as she emerged from the shower, her admirable but too thin body glistening. She wrapped herself in a towel and came up behind him, and Peter waited for her to ask, what was it like? Instead, she said, what happened to him? Was he hanged at Nuremberg? 
Who, Stoltz? said Peter, and June nodded. No, he was a pretty small fish. I wish we could find him, said June. I'd kill him. Would you now, said Peter. How would you do that? I'd shoot him. Ah, you have a license to kill, like 007? I'd push him out a window, said June. Her eyes were red, but she was starting to smile. And I would hold it open for you, said Peter. He looked at his watch, which covered the other set of scars on his wrist. This one he would bet the restaurant June did not know about. Nobody did, not Peter's relatives, not his staff. Peter never, ever removed his waterproof watch. We have to get you into a cab, he said. You're going to miss your plane. All right, June agreed, but she didn't move. And Peter didn't know why until she asked, can you really not feel that? And he realized she was running her hands over his back. No, he said, I have no sensation there. That was true, and it was the blessing of scars. The deeper they were, the more you couldn't feel anything in them at all. You see, it's really a very funny book. <laughs> there are parts of it that are funny. And it's not just me who thinks so. Like, actually, some of the reviews said so. So that's a sort of a, a good thing to have a little levity. But um, I wanted to read you this particular scene because it so encapsulates what I think of as one of the kernels of the book, which is June really wanting to know what Peter has gone through and asking about it and really caring, but Peter being unable to convey it to her. And that is the foundation on which their marriage is built. So to find out what happens next, you've got to get the book. <laughs> um, and I would love to answer any of your questions about this novel or about my other novels or other people's novels, um, writing, life in general. If I don't know the answers, I make them up because I'm a fiction writer. That's what I do. So, and we have such a lovely, intimate crowd. You can ask me anything. I'm not shy. Like, really, I dare you. You can ask me. So what are you going to work on then? Is it for World War II? This is usually the question in which I like leave. I'm like, oh gosh, it's so late. I have to go. Um, but yeah, we'll do that one first. Usually I don't have any idea of what I want to work on next. And at this stage, I would be happily promoting and test driving short stories because that's how um, I begin writing books. I have a, a couple of persistent characters um, in a short story who then have more to say, and I build a scaffolding of the book around the short story. But that process usually takes me three to five years to figure out what I want to work on. Um, happily, because these characters are so persistent, I'm actually going to be working on another Peter book. Um, and it's both a prequel and a sequel to The Lost Family. So although it will be a standalone and people who have never heard of me, and believe me, there are legions of them, will be able to pick it up and hopefully enjoy it on its own merits. Um, it's about, um, without giving away any spoilers, Peter's young family in Germany before the war, which I wanted to write about because I wanted to explore the erosion of democracy in an otherwise civilized country. Um, and um, then what happens, well, after the war when Peter is in his 80s and he has a sort of catalytic incident that forces him to go back and examine that very early past, which turns out to be not at all what he thought it was and what he thinks it is in this novel, too. So I'm very excited to have characters to work with who I already know and who I really love. Um, Peter, especially, is very persistent. So while I was at my house in Minnesota cooking, like I would suddenly have to stop and wipe my hands off and write stuff down. Um, and I'm also um, excited to return to the period of pre-Nazi Germany, um, for which I've done a lot of research, but not nearly enough. So I got to research the Weimar Republic, which was a very saucy time <laughs> um, in that country's history, and also really try and personify like. How is, it that it, how is it that a democracy fails? How does a republic erode even when people have the best of intentions? So. Yes. Um, when I read the book, excuse me, I'm having a kind of a brain freeze, but whose husband's name? Saul. Yeah. Yes. 
I will explain. I do not like him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to like him. <laughs> so, did you, I guess I want to know how you came to bring him into the story and that, you know, I don't want to spoil it for other people, a whole little sidebar of what he was really doing. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So, um, Saul and Ruth are Peter's sort of distant cousin. Saul is Peter's distant cousin who helps Peter after the war get out of a displaced person camp um, and into Westchester and New York. And Saul is what um, my dad, who was Jewish, would have called a big mocker. He is like a, a Park Avenue lawyer, um, born in this country, raised in this country, like, pulled himself up by his bootstraps after living through an immigrant childhood. Um, and then like has this beautiful spread in Westchester. So he commutes from that to New York and, and travels a lot and their lifestyle is very opulent and it's very upper class um, Jewish lifestyle in the suburbs. And Saul is my grandfather. So, and Ruth is my grandmother. And I had this sort of delightful time infusing them into the novel. You'll see them in all three different time periods. You see the house in Larchmont in three different time periods. It's a house I grew up in as a child every weekend, being dragged up there in my little frilly dresses. Um, my mom, the shiksa, as June is in the book, trying to navigate this very culturally Jewish household. Um, and my grandparents are openly calling her the shiksa, and my mom carrying her baggage of like Minnesotan, like mild anti-Semitism. So it was like, a really strange, um, schizophrenic sort of experience and very trippy to be in Westchester on weekends when I was a little girl. And Saul especially, you're not particularly supposed to like Saul. Like, he is actually a good man. He helps Peter. He has made a sort of a side business of getting Jews out of Germany during the war and after the war. He is a philanthropist. He's a patron of the arts. Like, he gives a lot away. And in private, behind closed doors, he drinks a lot, and he's really mean to his family. And this is, you know, not to tell tales, sorry, Grandpa, but that's what my grandfather was like. And I was always fascinated with the dichotomy between how you could be really such a philanthropic guy and help so many people, and still on the weekends be like, Ray, hey, bring me my fish, <laughs> bring me my scotch, fill my glass, and and like be driving around Westchester in your Volvo, like careening into all the lampposts because you're out of your mind on Crown Royale all the time. So Saul is one of my favorite characters in the book for that reason, not because I like him per se, but because he's very nuanced. And Ruth is much like my grandmother, like a gentle woman married to this man with a very large personality. And she, um, like Ruth in the book, had a secret garden in Westchester where she grew these ridiculously big vegetables, like frighteningly huge vegetables. And she cooked a lot. And so when I was creating the menu for The Lost Family for Peter's restaurant, Masha's, a lot of it was based on things that she would have made. It's like a, a smash up of German Jewish comfort food and then like run through the filter of 1965 so everything is also brown and like covered in whiskey. <laughs> I actually invented this whole menu and kitchen tested every item on the menu, tested it on my fiance, whose fault the menu is, because he came to me one morning when I was researching Peter's chef life, caught me reading, you know, the Betty Crocker new picture cookbook from 1965 and all these chef memoirs, and said, wouldn't it be great if the book had an actual menu in it, since it has a restaurant in it? And I thought, a great procrastination device. So then I spent the next three months thinking. Like, <laughs> Peter is German and Jewish, and his, his <coughs> wife, Masha, his dead wife, to whom this whole menu is an homage, was German, and they wanted to start a restaurant before she died about um, that was all of their favorite childhood foods together. So I thought, what would those items have been? And so I had a really delightful time cooking things like brisket wellington and chicken kiev, which involves doing really disgusting things to butter, or at least <laughs> um, extinguishing the pilot light in my stove um, to make baguettes, because then you have to throw ice cubes in to make the crusts crispy, and there were some explosions. And, you know, so it was, it, was really, it was really fun. And in the end, I, I found myself thinking a lot about my grandma, whose name was Ray, not Ruth. Um, really clever disguise there. Um, but I was thinking about what she would have done with the menu, and so some of the items are actually hers. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a lot of whiskey in the book because of my grandfather. And I had to drink a lot of whiskey to write. <laughs> so it's a, it's a hard life. <laughs> When you read uh, certain passages in a book, I haven't read this one, but, and you become, as the reader, so involved in the character, and you become sad, how, as a writer, do you get yourself out of those, like, depression pits? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, such a great question. I love all these questions. Um, I guess, I mean, I don't feel sad when I'm actually writing, although I know some of the scenes are difficult in advance because I write from an outline. I, I generally have a short story and then I build a sort of a, a laundry list of scenes and chapters around that short story and so I have a rough idea of the book's chronology and as I continue to refine it, you know, I take out some scenes that don't work and put others in. Um, and I, I pretty much have an idea of like where the, the trouble spots are going to be emotionally. But, um, and my prayer when I sit down to write those scenes is, I hope I get this right. Like, I hope I get the tone of this right. It's very important to me to try and evoke the emotion that the scene deserves in the reader without being foo-foo, without being fancy, without trying to show off as the writer. Like, it's really about the characters and their struggle in that moment. So when I enter into them, I'm going in with a work ethic. You know, and it's sort of like, oh my God, please let me be worthy of this. Usually the scenes that are very emotional, it's almost like a blackout experience. I write them so fast that it's like running a tightrope across a chasm and you just hold your breath until you get to the other side. I could tell you in each book that I've written which scenes are like that and you as readers would probably be able to guess like the scenes where you're holding your breath because you're like, <gasps> are the scenes where I have sort of had to hold my breath to write them. Now I'm getting a little bit teary thinking about them. Um, but then I, I'm grateful when I'm done because if I've done a good job, then I've gotten to the other side. And honestly, I've never had one of those very emotional scenes go wrong. Like I never had to stop in the middle and put it away for 15 minutes and get more coffee and come back. Like I just go boom and it's out. It's the other scenes around it that I have sometimes more trouble with. Um, but when I listen to the books on audio, which I have the great privilege of doing, it's a totally different experience. It's like, you know, in a, I remember that I've written them. But having somebody read your book to you, like I think, oh my god, I can't be in traffic when I hit this particular scene because I'm going to have an accident. <laughs> um, but still, like I find myself very frequent. Like I find myself very upset during certain scenes. It's like, oh my god, these poor people, even though I knew that that scene was coming. And weirdly, there are some scenes that I didn't know were going to be that affecting, that when I'm listening to them, um, as it, it helps me be more of a reader, then I'm just like, oh my god, this scene was really tough. So this is what I inflicted on my readers. Okay, I get it. Um, and with this book, I listened to it when I was driving out to my Minnesota house and then part of the way back. And there were some scenes that I forgot I thought were really funny. So I was like driving along laughing like a lunatic. So that was kind of fun mm -hmm. too. So yeah, I guess when I'm engaged with the process, I'm not emotional. Cause it's like Graham Greene says, there's a splinter of ice in the heart of every writer. But once I'm not a writer anymore and I'm reading or listening, no, those are hard. Yeah. Reading other people's books, I'm like, you know, sometimes I shouldn't really be driving around listening to my book. <laughs> I was listening to a book on the way down here. I just finished it like a minute before I pulled into the parking lot. And that was actually not a great thing to do because it was a very moving book. And then I was just like, not only did I have all this like sort of traffic, but I was like, oh my God, those people are all gone. And I, I missed the characters of a great book that I'm reading or listening to when I put it down. This one was called The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay about um, the AIDS crisis in Chicago's boy town in the 80s. And then there's a corresponding Parisian part in the present day. And I'm not really doing it justice, but the people in that book are so real to me and so alive that there were times when I was, you know, driving on I-90 being like, oh, oh, you know, like <laughs> forgetting to go to the rest stop and then five hours later being like, I really have to go to the bathroom for five hours. <laughs> Power of fiction. I told you I don't give a short answer. You're pinned here. For, for 
are some of your favorite authors to read? Oh gosh, my brain shorts out like I bold. Every time somebody asks me this question, I should just start bringing uh, like a list with me. But um, I love um, Meg Wolitzer. I'm going to go with who I've read recently. Um, the Interestings, um, The Wife, which is now a movie that I'm excited to see. She writes really smart, really funny fiction. I like books that can make me laugh. If they're going to make me cry, they have to make me laugh also. I love Ann Patchett, and I especially love Ann Patchett not just for her fiction, but for her essays, which are kind of like, I feel like she's teaching me about life when I read them. Um, I love Stephen King, like old Stephen King. And my apologies, like hopefully he's not there hiding in this panel or something, but I think the new Stephen King is not well enough edited. It's all like 800 pages longer than it should be, um, but I'm helpless to not buy them anyway. Like I always buy a Stephen King novel, but I love his older stuff. Um, Larry McMurtry, like these are the guys that I reread every year. And then my sort of secret comfort food writer who I read a book or two from every year, reread, is Belle LaPlane, who oh. is a, um, <laughs> I hear like the approbation of her. Belle LaPlane is a Jewish saga, Jewish family saga writer, and I was, reading and thinking about her a lot when I was writing Lost Family. Like, in a way, um, this book is my hat tip to her, about these people like struggling to do the right thing and always doing exactly the wrong thing, which is what makes them fun to watch. And as soon as I go home, I'll think of other readers, other writers I really love to read. Oh, I just had a question about social media generally. Like, what are your I imagine it's kind of a blessing and a curse as a writer now, but how do you keep up with it? Do you keep up with it? Do you do it yourself? Like, just talk about Twitter and Facebook for a minute and how it plays into your life as a writer, because it has to be time for it, it, That's the first time anybody has ever asked me that, and I'm so glad you did. I think I probably would have written at least three more books if I weren't on social media as much as I am. And you forgot Instagram, which is oh, like yeah. the new thing. Yeah. Um, and I have to be on Instagram because my agent is on Instagram. She's not on Facebook and she's not on Twitter. And for years, my agent is French and she speaks like a Judith Kranz villainess. So she was like, I know you are not meeting your deadline because you're on the Facebook. <laughs> you have to get up to Facebook because you have a contract. So stop posting little picture or whatever and write me a scene. So that's how she was until like a year ago. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hey guys. I scared them so bad during and they were funny. <laughs> um, so cute. Um, yeah, so then she got on Instagram like last year and she's like, Jenna, why are you not on Instagram? Instagram is the thing. Like you should you should totally be on where's your book and now you have to do Instagram story. I'm like, I don't know how to freaking do Instagram story. It's like you have to post videos of little bluebirds and crap flying around your head. And put on cat glasses and you know, and she's like, but Julia is on Instagram and she will teach you how to do story. And Julia is her immensely cool 14-year-old daughter. So Julia goes through my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, not Twitter because Twitter's too snarky, but she goes through my Facebook and Instagram feeds and sort of provides me with what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> and last time I saw my agent in New York, she sat down next to me and she's like, see, it's not such a big deal to do story. Like, if you just hit this little plus sign and then you see, you post a picture, like, here's me and you bleh, and you put it up. <laughs> and now we have sparkle, and now we have, like, jazz hands, and there's hashtag, and I'm like, this is, no, you know? So, because basically, I already was spending right before Lost Family came out, and if you follow me on social media, you know I'm a relentless, relentless marketer, like a relentless promoter. And I, I try to be out of the box with it because nobody just wants to hear about me all the time. And yet, that's kind of what marketing your book is. Like, it's the, oh, my book, my new baby, here it is again in a new way, you know? So that's my task. Like, every day, all day, I'm on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram saying, guess what, my book is coming. If you haven't heard that, the other 53,000 times I posted that in the last three months. But we kind of have to do that now. Like writers work with their publishers in conjunction with the publishers to do that. And I am lucky enough to be um, an exhibitionist writer who actually doesn't mind showcasing parts of her personal life alongside the writing stuff. So I've been on Facebook for years being like, here's my dog, here's all the stuff I've canned, here's the cake I just made, here's my book cover, here's what I'm reading, here's my yoga pants, here's my, you know, look at me, look at me. Like, that's not a problem. 
Um, and I also enjoyed Twitter until the election because whenever I felt indignant about something and didn't want to post it on Facebook where I'm like, no, 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 like I'm really nice on Facebook. On Twitter, I'm just like, I hate everybody that pit traffic and Donald Trump. <laughs> so that's where I go when I like want to drunk tweet at Donald Trump. And I'm just like, on Twitter at 11 o'clock at night. And then in the morning, I'm like, Oh, did I actually <laughs> did I actually say that? I guess I should post something about the library I'm going to tonight instead and try and like be a normal person again. Um, and then Instagram apparently is for you know showing pictures of your life, no politics. And then if you want to promote something, you have to do it on Instagram story with Twitter and fake tweets and blue bird. Yeah. So it's sort of an ongoing, it's like an art in progress kind of thing, the marketing in progress. Like there's some new channel every day, you know, you sort of struggle to keep up with it. Um, right before the book came out, I was literally on social media eight hours a day and then going to do events and also planning this ridiculous ass launch that I did where I was wearing like this gold lame pantsuit. I mean, nobody does this. Like I was like, you know, this is not actually normal person stuff, I realized like halfway through. Um, but it was hard, honestly, and it wasn't just hard from the vantage point of being like a writer slash marketer. When I'm marketing, I am marketing baby. Like I am not working on a book right now at all. Like I'm in full promotional mode. I'm reading and thinking about the next book and maybe writing down some notes. But this is it. Like I want to come and see you guys and engage with you and on a show. Um, I'm saying as a marketer, marketer, it was hard to keep up. Like I actually almost had um, a kidney infection right before my launch because I was so exhausted from like doing all the social stuff. So um, it's a great way to connect with people. A lot of people who come to the readings come because I know them from social media, which is so awesome. Like sometimes I meet somebody I've corresponded with for like eight years and there they are in three dimensions. It's like super exciting. And I, I love that aspect of it. But I also am trying to ration it not even for the sake of my writing, but for the sake of my health, <laughs> like my mental health, um, so that I'm not online all the time. Like I, I love marketing, but I don't think that's a terrific way to live. So I try now to limit myself to maybe an hour a day of social media on top of my regular correspondence, um, and then not go on Twitter after 10. <laughs> 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 so I stay out of the dungeon? Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I'm still trying to get Trump to block me. Like, I'm still trying. Uh, he blocked Stephen King, but he has not blocked me yet. So clearly I'm not doing a good enough job. But, you know. Give me a few glasses of wine off. I'll try. It's <laughs> a great question. Yes. Um, I liked how you did the three sections. I loved Peter's section. That Thank you. Um, June? She caused me some problems, but I understood where she was coming from because of her whole relationship with Peter and you know their marriage and stuff. Elspeth's section made me cringe, and I I almost want more of her story. Like I want to see what happened afterwards. Almost like in your next story with Peter, I would love to see Elspeth and where she ended up. Oh, good. I'm like sort of holding my breath while you're talking. <laughs> you mean cringe in a good way, right? Yeah. <laughs> is there a good way to cringe? It is. It, but you made me, um, I was invested in her. So I was invested in the character, even though, you know, it did make me the, the you know, I don't want to give it away. So, you know, where she ends up in that section, um, I felt for her. I wanted something. Yeah, I'll see what, the, tough, where she went. Also, that's a tough time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I won't give away spoilers with yeah. her section, but I will say that because when we meet Elspeth in 1985, she's a teenager, so as you can imagine, she's not making really healthy life choices, and she grows up with parents who are a model of benign neglect because they're both preoccupied with their own issues and their marriage is challenging. So Elspeth reacts to this as a teenager would, which is by sort of shooting off in her own direction. And I won't, this isn't too much of a spoiler, but at the beginning of her section, and this is actually the first thing I wrote for this book proper, was the beginning of Elspeth's section. When we see her at her like faux grandparents' house, it's all in Ruth's house in Westchester, and she meets this young artist um, from New York named Julian. And Julian 
is both the toast of New York and the controversy of New York because he is now making a living and a name for himself taking photos of naked preteens and teenagers, which he does for like very altruistic, um, artistic reasons, but of course everybody is like, you're basically a, a pornographer, so a lot of controversy. Um, and Julian himself is an extremely messed up character. So of course when I put Elspeth on the same terrace with him, and she's 15, and he says, hey, can I shoot you? Um, she immediately falls in love with him and says, like, I, love I love you. You're the only one who, can, who sees me. And I know nobody in here, myself included, has ever made bad decisions as a 15 year old. Elsa may or may not be me. She's a total hot mess. Not that I ever had an affair with a photographer <laughs> who shot me at three teens. <laughs> and I have to clarify this because my fiance is a photographer. <laughs> section was discussing it with him, who's like, oh great, now everybody's going to think I'm Julian and I should. <laughs> so he wants me to tell you that he shoots severe weather and nature and landscape, and he actually is like a National Ge Geographic photographer, he's very talented, but has never, to the best of my knowledge, or his knowledge, shot a naked child. So, um, but he did actually help me a lot with the Julian character, and it, it was such a strange world to go into, the Elspeth world, because I thought, what would you do if you were a teenager and you loved your parents so much and you had all of this love and all of this anger to give, but your parents were just not there, they were just not listening. Um, of course you would go looking for love in all the wrong places. And um, Julian, is, his situation is based a little bit on Sally Manns, the photographer who took pictures of her children in the nude and then got in trouble for that, and also on a young man named Jock Sturgis, who in the 80s had his work taken away by the FBI um, and was under grand indictment because people couldn't decide whether he was a pornographer or not. So I thought this is such a great plot device for this section to have Elspeth like work out a lot of her angst um, and it's also a lot of it gets wrapped up in food because her dad is a chef. Her mom used to be a supermodel who thinks Elspeth is too fat and Elspeth is all too aware that she had two little half-sisters who died in a concentration camp and she envisions them getting thinner and thinner and starving to death and she knows her father is still in love with these two little girls. So her whole section is not particularly easy to read but I had such an intense time writing it because of all the drama of those years and I feel like nobody's really as dramatic as a, as a teenager and I was interested in her world all of her experiences in New York and the club scene and stuff, which you'll see, are mine. It's fun. I actually saw George Michael in a club in 1986, which was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got my crinoline skirt and my giant fountain of hair. Um, and my high school friends are in that section, too. Um, so there was a lot of love for me in that section, but I know it's tough to read. And hopefully you'll be gratified that in the next book, in the modern day section, we see Elspeth as an adult and what has happened to her. And yeah, I'm, I'm earning the bag because I'm just like, she's just such a piece of work. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Hopefully, you guys all want to read this now instead of being like, that was like one of those previews that gave away the movie. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another question. Do you shoot still cheese storms? Oh. Yeah, do I still cheese storms? Um, A little bit. I actually, in Minnesota, there was a storm system that was moving fairly close to my house, so Jim, my fiance, who does still shoot sometimes, um, we were like, well, let's just go chase this. But really what happened was we like, drove out on some rural roads, and then we watched some clouds, and it rained, and I was like, this is just not that interesting anymore. Um, but I don't do what I used to do, which was when I was researching my second book, The Storm Chasers, I used to go out every summer with a professional storm tour company called Tempest Tours. And we would spend you know, several weeks out of every summer looking for storms that would produce tornadoes, which was its own sort of subculture and a complete concentration. Like it's a discipline, like a scientific discipline. Um, and I don't do that anymore. I lived in Kansas for three years in the interim, and people are always like, why? Because um, Jim was living there, so I moved there for love. Mm -hmm. And um, he was living there because there were storms, and that's what he shoots. And I learned while I was there that maybe like going on weird storm safari in the summer and while you live in Boston is like kind of cool for research and interesting. When you are experiencing 
huge severe weather as a lifestyle, it's super not fun. And I was working on Grand Central at the time, and I'd be working with Peter and you know this whole like Jewish New York scene, and there would be like a super soul moving in over the house like a mothership, and the sirens would all go off, and I'd be like, now, you know, and then we would have to like throw the dog in the car and drive away from it, and you never knew whether your house was going to be there when you got back, so I had to put like all my tiaras and clothes in the car, you know. <laughs> I was like, this is just not, I'm going to go back to Boston. So I did. But every once in a while, you'll see me post something about weather. And right now, of course, since my guy is a weather geek, uh, we know way too much about Florence. Mm -hmm. So like every text I get from him is like, Florence is taking this 1.5 turn, hairpin turn toward South Carolina. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. So um, if anybody has family in the path of that storm, then I, I feel for you. Cause Hopefully we won't get it here either. Yeah. <laughs> I can just look at you guys in, in the front row like I used to when I was teaching. You <laughs> <laughs> so make scary eyes. <laughs> You're not scared anymore. You already asked a question. You're on the You can go. Anybody who asks a question can leave. Everybody else has to stay. <laughs> The bell, the bell will ring, and I can sign books for you if you like. And if there are no more questions, are there any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.